and are really uh, a normal part of our, our daily lives. We interact with this vast cyberspace through the web. The internet is a little broader thing than the web, and this is perfectly normal. It blends seamlessly into our physical life. Now, the web is indeed where all of the human information is in form of books and media and art and everything else. And it's also where most human activities are. Facebook has over a billion users. And that's exactly what those things will say. It will be foolish to think that we'll somehow build a new separate 3D version of the web, mostly for gaming. That is not going to happen. So the natural thing to think about this is that what we're talking about here is the next evolutionary stage of the internet, which will have 3D content and which people would immerse in themselves. And the easiest way to do this is through avatars. The reason why web became so successful, you remember it was created as with a very limited goal of sharing preprints in high energy particle physics but it took over the world. The reason why that happened is it wasn't uh, really proprietary. It was open. There is a set of standards and protocols. If you can use it, you can join. You can build, in your, own, build your own websites, put any content you want on your website, but it's free and it's open and it's not governed by anybody, any company or any government, even though China and Russia are doing their best to control theirs. So that is really implying a number of important technological issues about standards of interoperability or how things function and so on. And a lot of people are thinking hard about all this. Well, why 3D, right? So you can think of it, this is an evolution of human to computer interfaces starting with the simple 1D text or sound, and then going through 2D images or videos, and heading naturally into 3D equivalents of images and videos, you can think of as holograms, and avatars, and so on. So why 3D? And that's because we live in a 3D world. Billions of years of evolution optimized us to live in a 3D world, to interact with the 3D world and with each other in three dimensions. And therefore, being in a three-dimensional environment really fits best with our sense of presence is, orientation, the pattern recognition, which makes us survive, our memory, what we remember, relationships to other people, and so on. And why avatars? Well, there is an interesting thing that was first described uh, by Stanford University professor Jeremy Balenson. It's called the Proteus effect. They were studying how people interact in virtual reality, how that reflects into their real life and so on. And they noticed that often humans, people identify with their digital representations. And especially if they're in 3D and immersive virtual reality. Very soon you start, start to think of it as your avatar, as yourself, and it is your it's just a different interface you have to the world. And also about their friends as with, identified with their avatars. And then what they do in virtual reality can often influence back what they do in the real world. So for example, Balenson and, and colleagues discover that uh, if avatars do exercise and pixels don't get fat, nevertheless, people behind those avatars then start to exercise more in real life and so on. So this is, the, this is a very powerful thing. This really clicks with our perception of the world. And that's why having 3D avatars in a 3D virtual environment is going to be qualitatively and quantitatively different from having your 2D avatar, which is just a picture usually. And you don't really identify with it at the same level. So, Avatars are really subspecies of virtual humans, which is a booming industry right now, very growing technology. I'll say more about this later. And in order to identify with one's avatar, it has to be sort of 
realistic, quasi-realistic human. Of course, you can you are allowed cosmetic enhancements, but it has to be human, right? And what you see often these days, including on Meta's horizons, right, are avatars that look like childish cartoons. And I don't fully understand why that is. I know why they're cartoons, because that's much less demanding on graphics technology and the bandwidth than having a, a realistic 3D looking humans. And they're not even complete humans. They're sometimes just torsos and hands or missing lower half of the body. Again, for those reasons. So this is just a limitation of the technology. It's going to be 3D and it's going to be human-like things as opposed to childish creatures in cartoons because humans will want to identify with themselves as humans. It also may be the most intuitive, friendly way for us to interact with artificial intelligence. And I'll say more about that later. Well, between now and then, it's going to be a lot of hard work. And there is a virtual cap uh, uh, venture capitalist named uh, Matthew Ball, his URL is shown here, who has given a lot of thought to this. And I would say he's probably one of the leading authorities in the subject. He's got this whole set of essays that describe technologies that have to be developed or improved in order to achieve this vision. And I listed some of them. Well, a lot of them will happen thanks to the Moore's law that information technology improves in some price performance sense, doubling every year and a half or thereabouts. And right now the headsets we use for virtual augmented reality are way too big and clunky and expensive and not really good. But there are also things to, uh, that will capture human expressions and body language and motions and called haptic technologies that give us sensory reaction. Like when you virtually grab virtual object that you will have to feel that you, as if you're really touching some real thing. You need a lot of bandwidth for something like this. 5G is just a start. It's going to be not gigabyte, but terabyte networks in the future. Graphics has to be much, much more powerful and so on. So that will take a lot of work and a lot of to and fro and agreeing on standards and so on. And different parts of it will take, I would say, between five, five, 10, maybe even 20 years. But it's clear that that's what's going. People understand what are the needs and they'll, they'll make them. Because remember, this is going to make web look, look like a child's play in terms of commercial and other uses. Well, let me step back then and you know, just review the issue of human computer interfaces. Whenever you use computer these days, you almost never do any actual computing. You, we use computers to find and manipulate and display information by and large, which is not the same thing as number crunching. We use computers to, to do computing too, but by and large in daily life, it's really not about computing, it's about manipulating information. And it started after World War II with the roomfuls of machinery and people typing on teletype style terminals and then it got better and better and we had desktops and minis and laptops. And then the mobile computing, which now dominates the human computer interaction through cell phones, tablets, stuff like that. And the natural next thing is introducing third dimension into it through various forms of augmented and fully virtual reality, which together are called the extended reality. Virtual reality means you're fully immersed into 3D generated scene, and you just see that. Augmented reality superposes hologram st structures in front of your eyes while you see the rest of the scene around you. Now that's probably going to be the dominant mode, but that's technologically actually much, much harder. Why? Because it's hard to stitch this holographic reality on top of the real physical reality without any issues. So 
the good thing about this is that the gaming industry and other parts of the entertainment industry has invested enormous amounts of money in developing these devices and technologies. They're strong commercial drivers. It was, I think, I think even over a decade ago that video games surpassed movies in terms of economy, number of dollars they make per year worldwide. Um, when a blockbuster movie is shown in theaters, if it makes $100 million the first weekend, this is fantastic. It's phenomenal. Usually it's much less than that. When a popular new version of video games comes up, it makes billion dollars the first weekend. And industry noticed that. And so this is a technology that will make games better, which is why people think of metaverses video gaming space. But it's nice that they're paying this money because we can leverage this enormous commercial investment to do other things in science and scholarship and education and so on. So let me just show you, this is, this is real. This is here now. Um, it's not just gaming anymore. It hasn't really made much impact in gaming yet because the headsets are too expensive, but it's making a lot of uh, inroads into enterprise and commercial sector. And so there are a lot of people now in the engineering world who design new things in augmented reality or even fully virtual reality. And I know, for example, there are engineers at JPL who are designing new spacecraft using augmented reality because it's so much easier to move bits than to actually make things for metal and plastic and put them together. And it's easier to manipulate. And moreover, you can virtually slice them open and see what's going on inside. So I would say probably every sophisticated piece of machinery these days is at some level designed in extended reality, whether it's new cars or jet engines or spacecraft. There is also a lot of obvious um, like educational uses, and in particular in medicine, where you can have full 3D scans from MRI and other things for students to learn, for surgeons to plan how to do surgeries and so on. Because again, humans made out of pixels are much easier to manipulate and this <laughs> slice and look into than real humans. Uh, a lot of issues why you wouldn't do that, uh, even even dead humans. So this has been really a boon for medical education, and there are a lot of applications in this domain. But even before this recent boom, thanks to the headsets, the partially immersive virtual reality in form of virtual worlds has been finding a lot of good therapeutic uses. So this nice old lady on top left, he, her name was Fran, and she had Parkinson's disease. Unfortunately, she passed away a couple of years ago. Well, her daughter um, introduced her to Second Life as a social space. And in it, Fran became this 20-year-old beauty, like maybe she was when she was 20 years old. And Fran had a blast. She went dancing and she went traveling to ex exotic places, all in this desktop virtual reality, made new friends. There were things were written about her. And guess what? Through all these activities, her brain was stimulated enough so that she regained some of her physical capabilities in terms of being able to get up and walk and stuff like that, which is kind of amazing, but it's part of that Proteus effect. This is not new. This is maybe 10, 12 years old. The US military found many good uses for it, not just for training, but also for therapy, for uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, that they would immerse people in scenes and get them, let them go through it and re relive things and kind of get to understand what was going on with them and everything. I've read about case where severely burned soldiers were given headsets that they looked like they were in the middle of a mountain with the snow. And that made their pain go down from their burns. So it's pretty amazing. And also for training, it was much better and easier to 
train soldiers in a virtual Fallujah than to send them to actual Fallujah. Well, my colleagues at JPL um, did an, an interesting experiment and they created um, virtual Mars scenery based on images from Mars rovers and from the orbital Mars spacecraft. So it reconstructed a 3D terrain. And if you put the headset on, suddenly you're standing on Mars next to the Curiosity rover. And you can look around, you can walk about a little bit. The perspective shows you what, where. You can interact with your colleagues who can be somewhere else in the world. They have this ghostly appearance, but that, because that was just the easiest thing, easier thing to do. And so they tested people who drive Mars rover, you know, because of the delay time, that you don't drive it in real time. What they do traditionally is they have a lot of panoramic photography and they say, oh, this, this rock looks good. Let's go over there. Um, and um, that's how they, they used to drive rope. So they split that group of people, rover drivers, into two. One of them was doing the same thing. It was a control group. The other half was given headsets. And they gave them tasks to estimate relative distances and angles between different things they see in a 3D environment. And then they compared how well they do. Well, the people doing it in virtual reality were four times better in terms of the accuracy in estimating things in immersive 3D space than people doing it in traditional 2D panoramic photography. The same result was also seen in many other fields. But in any case, what this resulted is that Mars rovers are now driven in virtual reality, have been for several years, and not many people know this. In many, many fields, similar experiments were done, and it was found that you're much more accurate in judging geometry of the situation in virtual reality than in any other way. It's also easier to remember, and it's, you avoid things like occlusion and, and perspective and so on. Well, that leads me into what I found the most interesting, at least at first, which is to use extended reality, virtual reality, as a data visualization platform. Something that's generally not really appreciated is that a whole big data story People talk about how data are big, and they are, and they're growing exponentially. But that's not the hard part. Moore's law takes care of that. The really hard part, and with greatest opportunities, are in data complexity and data information content. Data are much more information rich, but sometimes so complex. Let me give you an illustration of what complexity means. Um, suppose you're studying some things whether it's people or genes or cars or stock market. And so for each individual item, you measure a whole number of different things. For people it could be all kinds of clinical demographic variables for cars, could be technical issues for stock markets without individual stocks. And every one of those components of whatever you're studying is one column in a spreadsheet, whereas each of those individual items is one row. The number of columns is the dimensionality of the data. And if you have one column, you can plot histogram or pie chart. If you have two columns, you can plot X versus Y plot. If you have three, you can use crummy 3D plotting routines. But what if you have 300 or 3,000 columns? Uh-oh, now, now you're out of luck. Because we can see in 3D, but actually we can comprehend things in up to 10 dimensions if encoded properly in graphical variables. So that is the real bottleneck of all data science. It's not the machine learning. Machine can handle as many dimensions as you want, although it doesn't scale very well beyond five or six dimensions. But in order to actually get any knowledge out of the data, you have to understand what's happening. And you never understand anything unless you can visualize it in some form. So any technique that lets you grasp more data dimensions at once than before is a really good thing. And it turns out that's exactly what virtual reality does. So we tried, we tried this a long time ago, even with these flat virtual worlds 
And then that led to our startup Virtualytics. And the reason why this works is first of all, it's natural, it's intuitive, because we're again, optimized to look at things in 3D. And it gives you completely different perception of the data. Traditionally, you're outside of the data looking in at some flat displayed graph. In virtual reality, you're inside the data looking out. And so that gives you a much, much better perspective of what's going on. And there are things they simply cannot see in any flat image, no matter how you flip it around, that you can see better in 3D by going around, looking around, changing perspective. And you can encode more than three spatial dimensions through colors, RGB, through point sizes and shapes and transparencies, and you can animate points or you can make them glow, and you can put textures on them. In fact, you can encode as many dimensions of the data space in this pseudo 3D display, but you kind of lose count beyond 10. If most people can do just fine with about six dimensions, eight or 10, if they're good and well-trained, even 12 is a, seems to be like a human maximum according to some experiments. But that's a lot better than two, right? So we've been doing that at Caltech, working with scientists in different fields, biology most notably. This is a set of abstract data that are now spread into a 3D space, which you know you can display traditionally in the cube, just like the one I've shown you in upper right. And then you have to make a different cube to see it from some different angle. Whereas when they're in virtual reality, you can easily just turn them around and look and zoom in and dig into the data. And it just gives you much faster and better recognition of what's happening with your abstract data sets. You can run all kinds of machine learning and so on. So I mentioned that we then developed this as a commercial startup called Virtualytics, Virtuality and Data Analytics. And it's been doing fairly well, thank you. Um, I've been arguing from the day zero that we have to give free copies to any academic institution and unfortunately, the business people want to make money. And so that fight's still ongoing, but I'm going to make it happen sooner or later. There should be tool like this on every scientist's laptop because it gives you so much better and faster insight in what you're doing. Now, it's not just that humans that interact with the data. They can also interact with machine learning, artificial intelligence in the same virtual space, applying it to the data, see what it does, changing the algorithm, going back and forth. In the end, looking at the result of the analysis and understanding what was going on way better than you can do in any flat 2D plot. This is actually especially powerful with network analysis. Networks are a big thing nowadays. Um, and usually they're projected onto the flat screen of paper. But if you introduce just one extra dimension, third dimension, never mind things like colors and shapes and whatnot, suddenly the whole thing opens up in a way that you could just not perceive. And here's a link to a video that can show you how this works. Don't worry jotting it down right now. As I said, I'll show you up the slides online so you can do it at your own leisure later. And you can also interact with your colleagues. So in, humans interact with other humans, with their data and with machine intelligence, all in the same shared virtual space, but colleagues can be anywhere in the world, like in finance industry. They could be in London, Tokyo, uh, San Francisco, anywhere you want, but they still feel like in, they're in the same room and nobody had to fly anywhere. Right. So just that part alone, that we have really functioning, well designed way for people to interact without having to travel or even without having to commute is going to be really transformative. You may remember when the whole web thing started, people said, ah, this will finally enable telecommuting and so on, because you know most people in knowledge economy do nothing all day but sit in front of the computer, anyhow. 
Well, but what they missed was the human contact, the water cooler effect. The people meet their colleagues and chat in hallways or whatever. They can't do this easily on the web. But in virtual reality, you can. And it's like 90% of actually being there. And so that, I think, is going to have profound implications on the way we work, how our economy and everything else structured, in, in fact, the way the cities are designed. So we've been playing with a number of different things and it's written here what, what our goals are. We're paying real attention on the human user viewpoint an interaction viewpoint. My colleague Santiago Lombeda, who's a lead scientist for our virtual reality work, um, has a very interesting background. He is also adjunct faculty at, at the Art Center College of Design in Pasadena. So he understands design, has a strong artistic streak, also understands the data and has been working with scientists for decades now. So it's this great combination of skills that he can apply to how to design your data display in the way that's optimal for human user. So we've done a number of things like that. We, one of the things is that we decided how do you interact with things in virtual reality? That's a very big issue because with the flat screen, we have the usual point and click and swish paradigm, but that doesn't work. Um, if you're immersed in a space when there is no keyboard, all the people put virtual keyboards. And because a lot of the stuff came out of game industry, they use game controllers, we have five different buttons and, you know, and you know, a lot of people get lost with it. So we said, one button, which we can click or we can press. And with clever design of the interface, with this one finger, one button, you can do all the navigation you want. And this example here is from MRI scans of lung. We worked with um, medical uh, community studying the lung cancer, actually a whole bunch of different cancers. And right now um, we're working towards developing a superior virtual reality interaction tool for medical 3D and multi-dimensional imaging. We're getting a lot of enthusiasm from that community and that may be the most useful thing I've ever done in my life, but anyhow. Um, and so one thing that we've done in this particular project with lung cancer is uh, pathologists like to find tumors before it gets too late. And so usually what they do is they, they look at, they have these 3D scans through MRI or x-rays or whatever, um, and they look at them one two-dimensional slice at the time and the next one and next one. And what that does is it loses the 3D context. But when you display the full 3D scan inside virtual reality, and this is like small segment of lung in the middle, you can turn it around, you can look around corners, so to speak, you can take it apart and experts can then identify nodules of disease and mark them up. And now those parts of the images with all the measurements they contain can be used as a training data set for machine learning tool that can then go through thousands and thousands of patient scans and find exact same kind of things. And then the doctor can only look at only the ambiguous cases or the really interesting cases. So that can really speed up diagnostics enormously. And there, there are many other interesting prospects to do with uses of something like this in, in medicine. Well, sorry, skip one. What about education? Well, that is also not new. This is something people have been working for a good 15 years, if not longer, and almost 20 years. And here are just a couple examples from our early work in Second Life. There is, by the way, really huge technical professional literature on the subject. I gave Rosanna a white paper that has at least some references, by no means complete, but good start. And everybody who has been experimenting with us came to the conclusion that immersion leads to more student engagement, better understanding, and better uh, recall of things that have been learned. 
It's almost as if they're in real classroom. And now, after, especially after the pandemic, there is renewed growth of interest in this, also with full immersive reality. But basically, this is technology blends learning in social spaces and, and it also removes ge geographical barriers. Um, I can tell you all kinds of interesting stories of, from our experience uh, back in the day with the Meta Institute for Computational Astrophysics. And you can also build virtual labs in pseudo 3D. You can turn knobs inside VR and things happen. And we're now working more on similar things. So one of the things that we've been work, working about for the last couple of years is to build virtual teaching labs. And that has many advantages, one of which is, well, you can do things that are impossible in real life. You can have students enter molecules, or you can have, make them bigger than galaxies. Or if your chemistry experiment explodes, nobody gets hurt. Or if you're building nuclear reactor in engineering class, if it melts down again, nobody gets hurt. But most important for our students is they can do it in their dorm room at 2 a.m. They don't have to come to class. That is, seems to be the real attraction for them. This also, I think, is really one, the missing link of online education. You may recall a few years ago when MOOCs became all the rage, well, um, Basically, it meant we solved the content delivery, scalable content delivery online. What was missing for MOOCs is human interaction, peer-to-peer, student-to-teacher, and so on. Uh, social media can be used for that, and they do use it. But what's also missing is hands-on labs. Now, not everything can be digitized so far, but a lot of things can. So once you have fully online autonomous labs, that can enhance things quite a bit. And so we, we started building virtual spaces for education. We call it extended reality for teaching with classrooms. There are no avatars yet. They're just kind of floating headsets, the ways that students can interact with, with their instructor and so on. And more recently, um, we started developing a full software ecosystem that doesn't choose one particular platform, say Second Life, for example but that you can combine external computing to the actual number crunching that is used for experiment with social media, use virtual world as a display engine and so on. I know this is like a real scene of something like planetary motions that you can compute externally and, and so on. And so that's still work in progress because we can't be tied to any one given platform, but um, we want kind of seamless user-friendly interaction between a number of different things that can be optimized for any given educational case. So as a part of the pandemic thing, I built a little virtual campus for Caltech students in, in Second Life called Virtech. Caltech is in California, Virtech is in virtual reality. And the purpose of it wasn't so much for teaching, but to give a social interaction space to students because students were really missing that during the pandemic years. They learn a lot from their peers. That's, that, that's how they established their new networks. Uh, they left their high school world and now they're in a weird new world well, were there other kids just like them? That's great. But if they're cooped up in, in the room in their house, that doesn't happen. So there were a lot of mental health and well being issues. And so the purpose of this was really to provide them with something that's alternative to Discord or other social media. And there are also good stuff, good things you can do there. You know, they can discuss, they can work together on homeworks using whiteboards that are online whiteboards can build things like top right, there is a partial replica of the, of the cafe where they like to gather on Calto campus, or I can just play and relax in a nice kind of park-like setting. Which also <laughs> means like, what is the future workplace going to look like? And a lot of companies are thinking about it. And Meta is promoting it very heavily as are, as are other virtual worlds like science space and so on that indeed, if you can meet with your colleagues and interact um, through some immersive virtual environment, telework becomes real possibility. Um, there are many fewer reasons to go to your office. 
which is brought by this superior subjective sense of presence in immersive 3D. And so that is going to get better and better and more commonplace. And as I said before, this is going to change many things, not just remove the waste of time and energy in, in commuting um, with all of the carbon footprint, but just the way the cities are organized, and, and et cetera, et cetera. You can imagine yourself. But I should say, this is at least a decade away. But it can start now. Well, let's talk about virtual humans. That is one of the big buzzes now. And they come in many flavors. They, they're virtual social media influencers. The girl in the, well, the two of them in the lower left, Bella Hadid is the real life supermodel. And little Michaela is a virtual human. She doesn't exist in real life. But there was an ad for Calvin Klein, I think, Nike, I forget, where the real life woman and a digital woman hug and kiss. And that was a real shock, not just because it's a virtual human interacting with real human, but because two girls were kissing. Oh my God, you can't have that in America. Um, well, we've seen virtual actors. You know that Princess Leia had a cameo in one of the more recent Star Wars. You can resurrect that people. They're now training um, through deep learning networks on the basis of old movies to create virtual actors that look and sound exactly like their real life counterparts were. So we will see new movies with Marilyn Monroe or Clark Gable or John Wayne, anything else. And of course, there's a lot of all that going on for, for gaming. There are all of concierges, assistants, talk about it in a second, but also we may now have virtual tutors and teachers combined with all the online content for education, maybe powered by artificial intelligence to optimize individual instruction for individual students and so on. Um, that technology is evolving rapidly. We can already make purely completely photorealistic humans that don't actually exist like those in the lower right. And the leading institution, this is Facebook Labs. The two people on the, on the lower left are actually 3D representations of real people. And they make faces because they're trying to capture expressions and so on and so forth. So people will have their photorealistic representation. Of course, there'll be a slider. You can make yourself a little taller or a little less corpulent, should we say, and so on. But basically people looking like real people and recognizing each other, identifying with them, using their virtual representations to deal with all of the online content. And things will just blend in. So humans basically like to interact with other humans. And so why not represent artificial intelligences as humans, virtual humans? And that's already going on. Now, these days, you talk to virtual artificial, artificial intelligence assistants like Siri and Alexa and, and whatnot, but it's just a disembodied voice. What if you can talk to your friendly virtual assistant as a virtual person whose looks and voice and everything you can choose and that AI learns what is that you like and responds to you accordingly? Every time you use Google, you're, you're talking to, to artificial intelligence. How does Google know what things are you interested in? Because it learned about you from your previous searches. And so this is going to change things. And there'll be a lot of kind of low level jobs that will disappear because they can be easily replaced with well-trained AI. And humans can be used for more constructive, more sophisticated tasks. So where all this is going is the world in which humans and artificial intelligence and all kinds of information constructs are seamlessly integrated and interacting in various virtual spaces. Um, but that is a whole other story about how AI is going to come into this. So I'll just leave it at that. 
So let me go back a little bit. I've shown you pictures from virtual worlds and virtual worlds are essentially 3D spaces rendered on a flat screen. And this we could do for a long time. And that's much, much less technologically demanding than full 3D immersion and so on. And there are many of these, there are many games that are virtual worlds. My children have grown up with Minecraft, having play dates in Minecraft and video games and building stuff in there and so on. And so why should we do this? Well, first of all, they work, they're here, they're here now. And by and large, they're free. Then actually give you like maybe 90% of the value in terms of subjective sense of presence relative to full-blown immersive VR. So you get a lot of benefits of VR, but without having to have special equipment like a headset or something like that. And those headsets, are just not affordable for a lot of people. And actually they're not all that very good in terms of resolution and refresh rates and so on. People get seasick because of refresh rates are too slow, something like that. But basically that's your virtual reality in hand now. And you can start building things in it and trying it out and exploring and seeing what can do for you as the technology and commercial sector develops the full blown immersive metaverse. So there is a recent report I just learned about recently, and this is the link, and again, don't bother copying it now, which I found to be very interesting in how exactly is education going to be completely transformed by metaverse, and it's all for good. You can read the text later on your own, so I'll just wrap up. So these are the takeaways The metaverse, in my opinion, is basically going to be the next evolutionary stage of the internet or the web is driven by technology. It's going to be as transformative as the web itself. Think of the world before the web and the world today. That's the change we're going to see. And the main innovations is 3D content, things, data, humans, information, using extended reality technologies, which are rapidly getting better. And the most natural way for humans to navigate through this new cyberspace is through avatars with which they'll identify, and you can have more than one. And also you encounter other virtual humans, some of which are not actually powered by real humans, but by artificial intelligence. So this will enhance many, many different things. You have to be very powerful and enabling uh, just like the web was, is, including scholarship science and create new things that we didn't think of yet, new industries, new forms of art. And so right now, while waiting for all this, all these miracles to happen, we can do a lot of it with virtual worlds in hand, uh, surprisingly effective. So that's all I have to say. And indeed, this is brought by these two virtual people. The one on the left is, of course, Rosanna, and she looks exactly the same as in real life. And the one on the right is my avatar. And I always say, well, my avatar looks exactly like me, only he's only younger, taller, more buff, more handsome, and usually be better dressed, but otherwise we look the same. <laughs>